Am I on now? Yes. We had a little, uh, little loose wire down here. Good morning, church. I'm going to be like the bishop, and I'm, I'm going to have you try it again, all right? Good morning, church. It's so good to be back from annual conference and to also say, hey, you're stuck with me for another year. <laughs> Being stuck is good, right? But we know that the Spirit of God doesn't keep us stuck. We move forward, and God is good to do that. And so this morning I thought I had just a few announcements, and suddenly I got a lot of announcements, so I'm going to start talking a little bit faster and uh, try to figure out what order to do these in. You might be wondering why I'm holding this white shirt. Friends, if you have white shirts like this that you want to get out of your closet, we can use them for vacation Bible school as we do our STEM which is going to be science and stuff, all that goes with that. But we thought it would be really cute to have our kids come and be able to have little makeshift lab coats for them to do their experiments in. So if you have white shirts, um, I would love for you to bring them and we'll just pile them up. Uh, we'll probably need about 40 of them. And I think right now we probably have about 12. So go clean out your closets, a little spring cleaning. Um, Happy Father's Day, moms and dads and uh, sons and daughters and uh, cousins and neighbors. Maybe you need to buy your dads and grandpas new white shirts so they can clean out the white shirts and let, them, let us use them. I mean, if you want them back, you can put a little sticky note in there. This belongs to. We promise we won't get experiments on it. <laughs> I can't make that promise. But I'm glad that I had that to show you. I also want to share a couple of other things. There is no food drop on this Tuesday. Uh, Second Harvest uh, said it's too hot and there's not really enough of the food supply for us to be able to do it. So if we could spread the word amongst ourselves, I think we've been spreading it through Facebook and our uh, groups, but if you can just start letting people know... Um, I contacted the newspapers on Friday, so hopefully we've got it figured out where there is no food drop, um, and if people come on, on Tuesday morning, we'll just graciously tell them that we don't know when the next date is. Also, no youth group tonight. I know the screen a while ago said no, no youth Father's Day, and, and I, I wanted to clarify what that screen meant. It meant there's no youth group today because we want all of our students to be uh, at home celebrating Father's Day, and so that's what that is about. And I'm holding this poster because we have a lot of people in our church family that uh, do the young players, Maryville young players, um, and so if you have the ability next week to go and see Shrek, you're going to see some folks in our church probably with green faces, and that is going to be priceless, right? And I've heard that it has been, it's, the, the work on it has been amazing and it's going to be a great show. So if you have the opportunity uh, to go and support our community arts, I encourage you to go see Shrek, the musical, June 24th, 25th, and 26th. Um, and I think you can find that on Facebook and online. And also, if you want to look at this poster, I'll have it lay in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, right up here. We want to be in prayer for our scouts who are going on their trip, their annual trip to Camp Geiger, leaving this afternoon. And so we want to lift up uh, all of our scouts. And I also want to do a shout out to uh, Dane and Jonah, who have been working feverishly over the past few weeks uh, to earn their Eagle Scout. La <clears throat> last night, they uh, sat through, um, I don't even know what it's called, but they are now officially Eagle Scouts. They did so well. And Dane is back here today. We just want to say congratulations, Dane, and thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Eagle Scout project. We are, we're very proud of you. We're proud of Jonah uh, and his family also. Whew. I don't know if there's anything else I'm supposed to say. We've got a busy day today. Uh, but it's the busy in the Spirit of God. And so I want to invite the acolytes to come forward as we center ourselves, ready ourselves for worship, to know that we are here truly to worship our amazing God.
Thank you, Kim. I thought I was going to have to fold laundry this morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Our relationships with our fathers are complicated. Many of us, our father's love is like God's love, too deep, too, strong, too wide, too strong to measure. Some of our dads are here. Some were never here. For some of us, God's love fills the empty spaces our fathers left behind. All of us are shaped by the relationship with our fathers. On this day, when we remember what it means to have a father or to be a father, we recognize the importance, we recognize the importance of our fathers in our communities. We pledge as a congregation to love and nurture the fathers among us so that they will manifest the love of God in all that we may do. Amen.
Wow. I need a glue stick. Do it. <laughs> okay. Something's loose. Okay. I just want to say thank you to our own homegrown quartet. Um, uh, that was amazing. We'll just give it up to God for that and uh, just fantastic. Uh, you might have noticed a, it's a little uh, set change and the Bradleys taking off because they are worshiping. This is their Sunday to be at Graham United Methodist Church uh, where they provide once a month a music ministry. And so we're blessed to have such incredible talent uh, in our church. I want to invite um, anyone young at heart that would like to come up and grab a bucket because now is noisy offering and so i i've got about five six seven eight nine buckets up here so anybody who wants to come i know who wants to come up <laughs> vicky wants to come up andy's coming up the girls are coming up we're just grateful for that and today our noisy offering is going to uh, a united methodist offering uh, called peace with justice today is peace with justice sunday um, I just want to share with you, as they're passing around the buckets, as they're heading out, uh, raise your hand if you've got uh, money. That, yes, see, look there. They've got some change they want to put this in. Uh, from the uh, United Methodist Church Justice.org um, website, we find the reason that we have uh, offerings like we're ha having today. You'll find in the pew also the cards uh, that you came in and you probably sat on one so if you can't find one just lean a little bit and you might find the card in the pew uh, the website says in a world plagued by war terror violence and destruction people of faith have a clear call to build peace with justice you can't have justice without peace peace with justice. It doesn't say peace and justice because sometimes when we do that we get a little bit of a separation and we forget what we're responsible for. Scripture is consistent in the call for followers of Christ to love our enemies. Coming out of Matthew 5 verses 44 and 45. Forgive others as they trespass against us. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. To overcome evil with good. Romans 12 verse 1 and to seek peace and to pursue it. Psalm 34, 14. Peacemakers are blessed and called the children of God. Coming from the Beatitudes out of Matthew 5, verse 9. The Book of Discipline under the United Methodist Social Principles. Uh, I'll give you the number if you want to go look up the Book of Discipline. It's paragraph 165C for those of you that are geeks about the Book of Discipline. But I do want to read this to you. It says, as disciples of Christ, we are called to love our enemies, seek justice, and serve as reconcilers of conflict. We must insist that the first moral duty of all nations is to work together to resolve by peaceful means every dispute that arises between or among them. Uh, I will also um, add on this Father's Day, um, and Justice with Peace, Peace with Justice Sunday. Uh, a lot of churches across the country in our Sunday school classes with Jeff and Julie will be uh, having a learning experience about Juneteenth and what that means. And so I want, uh, I want us to recognize the importance of Juneteenth and what it means. Uh, you know, after the Emancipation Proclamation way back in Abraham Lincoln's day, it took two years for some of the slaves in our country to get the good news that they had been set free. And on that day, a group in Texas realized that they had had freedom for two years but had been still living under slavery and had been set free and celebrated. And Texas was the first state to observe Juneteenth and it began to spread across the country. And so I think it's important us as we seek justice Jesus was certainly a big fan of social justice. We have a responsibility to stand up as God's children and to represent and to stand up and to speak and to share and to live out the values of the gospel. And so that is what we're collecting money for today. Uh, and I thank you, each and every one of you, for making some noise in our buckets. And let's offer a prayer for that. 
Lord, we are just so grateful of your teachings into our life that remind us that we need to be selfless outside of ourselves recognizing that there are so many differences among us, but you created those differences. We thank you, Lord, that you open our eyes wide to see who we are to be in relationship with everyone as we seek peace with justice. Bless this church in this community to be that beacon of hope for everyone inside of this community to know that they belong, that they are loved, they are accepted and received. We give it all to you in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, and I was supposed to invite Melinda to come up. Where did Melinda go? I found out uh, Friday night that Melinda is a budding poet and a writer and a gift within her and she wrote something that she wants to share with us this morning and I thought that thank you for reminding me so many things going on <laughs> good morning good morning doesn't dislike you, God, because he always loves you, no matter what, even at the lowest points ever. When I was six, I realized situations where you are broken, God comes and builds you up, so then you can love your life through. God knows your strengths and weaknesses because he built you. No one else knows. But me, Lord, that you. Awesome. Thank you.
it's me. <laughs> you could say I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, electrifying. <laughs> you could say that. <laughs> I remember uh, singing that song uh, in my earlier years, um, Christine, and uh, the echo was, yes, even me. Um, And I think that's important for us to recognize. Yes, even me. Uh, The Lord lifted me with his love. How great it is that Melinda had in her heart. See, God works. She had uh, the need to write out something about how much God loves her, and it fit just perfectly for us today in our time of worship on this Father's Day where uh, we just celebrate the Father figures in our lives. Uh, And if you did not receive a a book, uh, Fathers and Father Figures, Nurturing Ones, there is a a book that is uh, in the back uh, called Man of God Rooted in Christ with some daily readings that, uh, that you can take and read and, and celebrate how God has lifted you, included you, strengthened you, and made you able to be the nurturer that you are today. And we're grateful for our fathers. Uh, we're even great, more grateful for the good, good Father in heaven that teaches us all how to emulate in his likeness what it means to be truly good um, and caring and loving um, fathers and grandfathers alike. And so as we come together today in this time of prayer, um, we know that it's been a, uh, a difficult week on our church family. The uh, flowers at the altar represent um, the past few weeks of funerals where we continue to lift up uh, Sandra and uh, the Sorensen family with grace and love and We certainly want to lift up um, Elizabeth Ann Burnside's Liz, our Liz and her family in our hearts. Um, And yesterday's service uh, with with Hal, Harold Hal Wilmarth. How many of us called him Harold? (laughs) He is always Hal to us. And uh, so we lift up those families that are living a a different different path right now in the uh, grieving but knowing the stories that we tell together the gift of family, the gift of eternal hope. and So we take those needs to us in prayer. Uh, During our time of reflection, if you feel that need to come and to kneel at the altar, uh, to come and to light a candle here on either side um, as a memory um, and as a healing opportunity, I invite you to do that. And if you're here today and you feel the need to receive a prayer shawl, Uh, See me right after church. Uh, Wendy and I are here to uh, assist in uh, helping you get a prayer shawl. Friends, we have a lot of them. This is only a small sample, and so uh, if you're looking for a prayer shawl for yourself or for anyone in your family, we have a wonderful ministry uh, that gifts these to the church and prays over them. And we would like to pray into your special need as you receive one. With all of that, let us bow our hearts. Let's empty ourselves in this time that we may fully receive from our amazing God as we go together in prayer. Gracious Lord, Holy One, our nurturing one, today is another day when we recognize our need to be nurtured. We long to belong, and you, Lord, you have been so, so good to place people in our lives that help us to know we do belong and that we are loved. Your love, as the good, good Father, shows us all how to love, to nurture, to be kind, and to be compassionate, to lift one another up. We need more of your kindness surrounding us so that we may be able to surround everyone that we meet with that same kindness with an invitation of acceptance and connection. Lord, we seek to be surrounded by those who nurture and encourage and sustain and nourish us as a loving father figure does. Loving God, you who are our father and our mother, we thank you that 
that you have shown us how important it is to follow your example as we grow in faith. And we know that we don't grow in faith alone. We grow in faith when surrounded by those who are also seeking and growing. Teach us together as one. Teach us to be obedient to your will, respecting you as children ought. Strengthen us to stand up against the challenges of this world, honoring your name and trusting in your grace. Father God, this past week weighs heavy on us at the loss of dear loved ones and celebrations of life experiences. For Ray Sorensen, we give you thanks. For Elizabeth Burnside's, Lord, we give you thanks. For Hal Wilmarth, Lord, we give you thanks, and we ask for your continued compassionate care over their families. Speak a peace into their hearts, and do not let their hearts be troubled. Empower your precious gift of story to be within each one of us who live and love, and who loved Ray, Liz, and Hal that as your children we may stand with those who mourn, knowing that you have not left us alone, but you sustain us in our emotional flurry as memories and joys flood our souls. We give all of our needs for the fullness of body, mind, and spirit to you for the gift of eternal life. And in this time, Lord, we lift up Wendy, who will be giving us a message from your heart to hers. So may the words of her mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and there was a stone lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that you, if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the sake of this crowd standing here so they, that they may believe that you sent me. And then he said, and then he said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were bound with strips of cloth and his face was wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Good morning, people of God. This morning, I'm going to tell you about a story that has to do with our grandson, Mateo Clay Ferguson. As a couple, one of the greatest gifts we can receive from God is the birth of a child. As you nurture your son or daughter and watch them participate in church, music, academics, sports, and art events, you observe their transformation from childhood to teen and eventually into an adult. Then as time progresses, they enter into a relationship with someone he or she loves. And after a while, the bond becomes so solid and they wish to have a baby. Sharing their news with their parents is a blessing beyond words. My husband Jeff and I received this wonderful news last August from Clay and Aaron. As the months progressed, we were informed that they were having a baby boy and his name would be Mateo. Mateo means a gift from God. On March 18th, we received a call from Clay letting us know that this beautiful baby boy had been born. We were all overjoyed with the arrival of his presence. Within 48 hours after his birth, we received a text, and it was the end of church on that day, that Mateo had spiked a fever. Upon receiving this news, Jeff and I went to the altar, and I yelled for Wendy, who was getting ready to set up for praise band, to come and pray with us for Mateo. She gave the most heartfelt, impromptu prayer that anyone could receive. Pastor Kim also knew what was going on, and we had a prayer with her as well. Fast forward. On March 25th, Mateo was life flighted to Children's Mercy Hospital because he was experiencing breathing difficulties and other health issues. As you can imagine, all of us were concerned and scared. We immediately contacted Kim and Wendy to ask for their prayers and support, and we certainly did receive it. At this point, Mateo was immediately added to the church prayer list. With the care of the Children's Mercy staff and the prayers from our church family, Mateo became stronger and by the grace of God, was able to come home after 10 days. He is now a happy, healthy, cooing little baby who is loved and cuddled by his parents, grandparents, and other family members. We want to thank the church for all of your prayers, support, and gifts of love. This has truly been a blessing in our family's lives. I believe in the power of prayer, and I know all of you do too. Thanks be to God. 
This is the story of the birthday of the world. At the start, there was only holy darkness. It was rich and deep and thick, and it covered everything. Holy darkness, the place where fullness of being and complete emptiness coexist. Holy darkness, the life source. And so it was. And then, at a particular moment in history, this world, this world of a thousand thousand things, emerged from the holy darkness as a beam of light. And so it was. Until one day, the light of the world broke. It burst and shattered into a thousand, thousand fragments and came down into all people and all places and all events that ever were, that are right now, and that are to come. And there it remains hidden and to this day. And it has been ever since. This is the story of the birthday of the world. Will you pray with me? Holy mystery, may we hold life so loosely that there is plenty of room for your Holy Spirit to blow right through us. Amen. That story was a fourth birthday present to Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen from her grandfather, who was a rabbi and a mystic. I got to hear this story on the podcast called On Being, hosted by Krista Tippett. That is an amazing podcast, On Being. She interviews outstanding people. Na Rachel Naomi Remen tells this story. It is one that has deeply impacted her, that has brought power to her life, that she shares in her book called Kitchen Table Wisdom. She also tells a story of her grandmother, the one who was married to the rabbi, her grandfather. They were from Russia, and there, as a rabbi family, they hosted many family and friends, and many, many people in need would come to their home. And her grandmother became very good at learning how to stretch the food, how to just make it go a little bit longer. When her grandparents immigrated to the United States, her grandmother was delighted at the abundance of fresh food that was available that they could secure. And so the family liked to tease her because she would pack the refrigerator, every nook and cranny, with fresh food. I mean, it was packed in there. The family said, if you open the refrigerator too fast, an egg might just roll out and hit the floor. And then their grandmother would look over and say, aha, uh -huh. looks like it's going to be sponge cake today. Rachel Naomi Remen remembers that story too. It had a powerful impact on her because when she was 15 years old in 1953, she was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And doctors came in to talk to this 15-year-old to tell her she had an incurable disease, that she would need multiple surgeries her whole life, and she probably would not live past 40 years of age. What do you do? You're 15. Stunned and sitting in shock next to her mother, this is what her mother did. She took Rachel's hand, she looked into her eyes, and she said, Rachel, we will make sponge cake. We feel a story, don't we? We feel it here, and we feel it here, before 
we figure out what it means up here before we can interpret it or understand it. The story needs a little time to rattle around our heart and soul before we can ask, what does it mean? What does it mean to have a thousand thousand fragments of light hidden deep within us? What does it mean to make sponge cake in the face of devastating news? What does it mean when Jesus says, come out, and commands us to come out from the grave? Human brains are hardwired for story. Like, we tell stories because we're human. We have told stories for thousands of years, around campfires, and in cottages and tents, and in cathedrals, and around gravesides. We tell stories because we're human. We tell stories for three reasons. To make meaning, to connect with one another, and to navigate life. Why do we tell stories? To make meaning, to connect with one another, and to navigate life. This worship series is Write Your Story, Tell Your Story. Thank you, Julie, for telling your story this morning where your story intersects the God story. Because when we do that, we are all blessed. That's why small groups in church are so vital. Because in those small groups, we hear the stories of our faith. And we say, oh, I connect with that. Here's how that happened in my life. And we share that with one another. And then that story is strengthened in us. And then we inspire and witness to the goodness of God for someone else to be strengthened as well. If you're not part of a small group, I urge you to go to God in prayer and be seeking about that. There is power in story, and we need one another to share stories. Eugene Peterson is the author of the message version of the Bible. And he says, in our culture, we are bereft of stories. We tell a lot of facts in little short snippets that we send to each other. Nothing wrong with that. You can get a lot done that way. But, he says, many facts do not a story tell. And we need the power of stories. I have a colleague in spiritual direction named Renee Bhatia, and she likes to quote one of her favorite mystics who asks this question. When did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop painting? And when did you stop telling stories? Because it was then that your soul died. We need the power of stories. The stories that a people tell make up their identity. That's the premise of narrative theory and narrative theology that the stories we tell make up our identity. That's why we look at the stories of God's people in Scripture. That's why we look at faith stories, because we see in our ancestors' faith stories our own stories. For example, sometimes we realize that we are acting like Jonah, afraid and on the run from a call God has on our life. We realize we're thinking like Moses, I'm not qualified to do that. I cannot do that. Could you choose someone else to do that, please? Or we wonder, like Mary, you're going to birth what through me? In Bible stories, we see where our story connects to the God story, where our story connects to the God story. Today, we look at the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And we tend to focus almost exclusively on what? The resurrection, right? Because we're a resurrection people, are we not? Yes. And in resurrection is the uh, inspiring, miraculous, stunning, unexpected ending, right? And in resurrection is the hope and the encouragement that we can reach out and take and hold. But what if today we took a new angle? 
What if today we focused on the holy darkness? What might we see or hear in the holy darkness that would nourish us spiritually? This is the story of the birthday of Lazarus. Jesus had three friends who were siblings, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, and they lived in Bethany. And one day, Lazarus became ill, and he wasn't getting better. And his sisters sent word to Jesus in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, under two miles from Bethany, under two miles. And Lazarus became worse. And Jesus didn't come. And Lazarus grew more gravely ill. And Jesus didn't come. He grew worse and finally succumbed to death. Mary and Martha were stunned and in shock. And still, Jesus didn't come. They gave Lazarus a proper Jewish burial, and mourners came to visit and pray and weep. Four long days of holy darkness for Lazarus in the grave. See if you can feel it. Four long days of confusion, disbelief, and agony for his sisters. And after four days, Jesus arrived. But it was too late. Lord, Mary said to him, if you were only here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus, who was fully human, at that moment was overcome by his own loss. And in grief, he knelt and wept. And Jesus says these four things. Where did you lay him? Take away the stone. Lazarus, come out. And unbind him and let him go. A great ray of light burst forth from the holy darkness, and Lazarus emerged alive. This is the story of the birthday of Lazarus. When have you been in the cave of death and asked Jesus to come, but he didn't? Maybe you struggle with addiction to shopping or food or alcohol. Maybe you're in a period of grief from the death of a loved one or the loss of a job or the ending of a significant relationship. Maybe you battle depression and anxiety, and you wake up every day hoping for relief. What Mary and Martha did not realize, and sometimes we don't either, is that holy darkness is the place where fullness of being and complete emptiness coexist. It is the life source the primordial soup, um, as it were, from which all new life is born, kind of compost-ish. Because the pattern people of God, and we know this from Scripture, the pattern people of God is death and then life, being lost and being found, being in captivity and being freed, being blind and having our sight restored. The pattern is darkness and light. We must go down to go up. We don't have resurrection without crucifixion. We like to jump to resurrection because it's way more comfortable, way more comfortable. But there is richness 
in the discomfort of holy darkness that we can embrace. Talk to people who've experienced a tragic loss or a deep, deep pain. So often they will say, I would not wish this on anyone, yet I wouldn't trade it for anything. Because gifts of light come from holy darkness, gifts like compassion and gratitude, gifts like peace and wisdom. The good news, people of God, is that we don't have to be afraid of holy darkness. Rest assured it will come because it is part of the human journey. But also, holy light is a guaranteed part of the human journey. The Christian author uh, Glennon Doyle says that life is brutal. It's brutal and beautiful at the same time, all at once. It's kind of that idea that there's joy in pain, and there's pain in joy, and it ebbs and flows, and that is the human journey. Sometimes as Christians, we think we shouldn't experience holy darkness. And when we're in the midst of that pain and we're hurting, we try really hard to look like we are all right, don't we? But just because we're Christians doesn't mean we get to skip holy darkness. Jesus never suggested that. It's all right to be there, and it's all right to acknowledge it and face it head on. The good news, people of God, is that we don't have to be afraid of holy darkness. Because there are a thousand, thousand fragments of life hidden deep within us and all places and all events. And we are born to rediscover it and to hold it up, to make it visible again. To hold it up that it might illuminate the innate wholeness of the world that is a latent, invisible reality. And when we do that, people of God, we become healers. And it's not about healing the world by making a huge difference. It's about healing the world that's right in front of you, that touches you. That's what Jesus did in the Lazarus story. Sometimes we think we probably need to be more before we can make a difference, right? We say, if I was just more mature, more wise, more powerful, more wealthy... We feel that we're not enough to make a difference just as we are. But what if the seed in this story, the birthday of the world, is this? We are exactly what is needed to heal the world just as we are. What if we held that in our hearts for a little while? And we asked, how would I live if I was exactly what was needed to heal the world? Yeah. Let us go forth from here today and tell the story of the beam of light that came out of our holy darkness because your story is powerful. Darkness is a given, but it doesn't have the last word. Amen. As we prepare to go out and be that light, if you're able, please stand and body your spirit as we sing through it all.
invite to come forward to gather the light from inside of this place and to reflect it inside of us. And as they gather the light, I want us to recognize that holy darkness is not there by itself because there is that holy light. And when we have holy darkness meeting up with holy light, we began to empty ourselves to be filled more of that light to bring healing into our souls. And so as we leave this place together today, may we be willing to hear the stories of our own life that take us from darkness to light and to create in us more of the light that we can share with the world. May you go in that light and in that peace, in the grace of our loving God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.